Hear then the word of God. Yahweh has established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom rules over all. So bless the Lord, you, his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you, his hosts, who serve him, doing his will. And bless the Lord, all you works of his and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us invoke God's name together. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Hear the greeting of your King. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us affirm we have come to worship the triune God who for us and for our salvation took on our flesh. Let us profess. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again. According to the scriptures, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. And now let us sing Psalm 98, affirming the rule of God and his rule being for our benefit, to set all things right when he shall come. So Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song voicing. Sing to the Lord a new song voicing, for mighty wonders he has done. His right hand and his arm most holy, the victory for him have won. The Lord has blessed us with salvation. His righteousness has he made known. He has revealed to all the nations that justice issues from his throne. He has remembered all his mercy, his faithfulness to Shout forth your joy and sound. 
Be seated. It is good, it is right for us to remember that the Lord's kingdom is already present, although not yet in its fullness, and he will judge in righteousness. So let us turn to the word of God to see what are the righteous judgments of God as revealed in his word. Let us then remind one another of the purpose of God's law. God's law displays his holiness and perfection. It is given as my only sure guide to knowing his will and pleasing him. But as a fallen man, I cannot obey the law. I turn to the law to see my sinfulness, that I may be humbled and confess my sins before God, because he declares, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. I will not be justified by the works of the law. So as we turn now to the law, we are going to look at how we are to consider our unity, our condition of being members of Christ's church, and to realize that while many people might consider that Christianity is kind of feeling proud of yourself and looking down on others, actually we are called to consider the incredible privilege we have to be in the body of Christ and therefore being members of one another. And so how we look at one another is also going to be a sign of how we are growing in holiness of life. Here then the law summarized from different passages. Everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus, before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is the head of the body, the church, and the church is Jesus' body. So let us not neglect to meet together with the body of Jesus, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another, stirring up one another to love and good works. Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So to have lawsuits at all with one another, demanding your rights in the church against those of others, rather than actually doing what Christ says, picking up your cross, would already be marking a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The reason we put the law together this way is to force us to consider. It's often easy for us to look and say, oh, you know, at least I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a gossip. And we can point to others and say, they're doing that. I'm not. What we see here, however, is what's your attitude? Is it that you consider it the greatest privilege in the world to belong to Christ's body on earth? And therefore, you realize it's worth throwing away everything else, including those things that the world cherishes, pride, honor, making sure everyone knows you're the good guy, others are the bad guys. Or would you rather, for the sake of unity and love of the body, you don't care what others think, but you rejoice that Jesus loved you that he grafted you into his body, and he's given you the privilege of serving others whom he chose and whom he purchased. And so this one is a very convicting law because it really takes the wind out of our sails. It really uh, prevents us from becoming proud and thinking, yeah, you know, I'm getting better. I'm not doing all these other things. Well, 
No. Do you really want Christ's church to mature, grow, and be the place where Jesus is acknowledged and proclaimed in the world and where sinners find life? That's what this question is asking us. So let us consider that if we are going to enjoy the benefits of being united to Christ, then we better start thinking Christ-like. We need to be willing to die to self as Christ was willing to die to purchase us for the sake of seeing that the gospel be preached effectively in the world and people actually find peace in the church. Let's die to self, stop insisting on our rights, and be willing to do good for all others. Let us confess our sins together. God has sent his son Jesus in the likeness of my sinful flesh as an offering for my sin. In doing this, God demonstrates his electing love for me in that Christ died for me, the sinner. That no one is justified by the law before God is clear, for the man who by faith is righteous shall live. I don't have a righteousness that is my own from my obedience to the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I believe that I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from my own works and attempts to follow the law. If we say that faith is a saving instrument, then we need to know what is this saving faith. Beloved, what is the true faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge whereby I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace, only because of Christ's merits. So knowing then it is only in Christ that you have life, let us now confess our thankfulness that God would love us so much and let us give up any self-righteousness and find our only hope in Christ Jesus alone. O oh Lord our God, we are unable, naturally, to understand just what it means to have sinned against your holy majesty. We live selfishly, self-centered, and we are unable to fathom the incredible blasphemous ways of which we have thought and spoken of you, how our actions have reflected our rebellion against you, and how much we truly have despised our fellow men and felt them to actually be the obstacles to our holiness. So we come before you now confessing that we have denied Christ because we've denied your church. We've denied the work that you've done by your spirit and bringing these people together to be the body and blood of Christ on earth. And we are a people so arrogant and boastful that we look down on all that you have done. And now you tell us, come back and find life in you. You tell us that despite all we've done, you will not hold our sins against us, but instead you paid for them. You shed your blood so that we would, we would not have to make the payment, but that we would receive free forgiveness. Lord, we ask you to give to us a heartfelt conviction of the truth of your word in order that we would stop denying your word and believing our own delusions of self-righteousness, of meritorious works. We pray that we would indeed learn to trust in your promise alone and in your merit alone and give all glory to you alone, recognizing that the one and only eternal God of all creation took on our flesh because he loved us to die in our place. May we therefore find in you everything we need and great joy and a thankful heart which responds with gratitude always and every day for all the blessings we enjoy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved, please stand that you may hear the sure word of the gospel promised to you this day. To you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merits alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven, the record of your transgressions is blotted away, and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus, 
who will resurrect you in the last day. And so it is for us to marvel and rejoice in the love of God and his grace and to proclaim the excellencies of Christ and his gospel to the ends of the earth. So let's respond by singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease, tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and breaks the power of reigning sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood availed for me. He speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. The mournful broken hearts rejoice, the humble poor be. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and we be laid for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of the Please be seated. So every week on page 16, we have a list of things to pray for as we spend time at home in prayer and also as we come together praying for our own local church, for our federation and the missions of our church, as well as for the needs of the mission to the church to the whole world. So let us now come before our God in prayer. We come this day before you, our great God. And we ask that you will work in us by your spirit to help us to realize what an awesome blessing and a privilege it is that we have not been left forsaken, alienated from the covenants, having no hope, but rather you've gathered us to be the Israel of God and have brought to us all the promises and blessings of Abraham already, though not yet in its fullness, a greater glory still to come. We already live a resurrection life because in Christ we have received already the first resurrection. Our dead spirits have been made alive, united to Christ, and we now belong to you and to one another. And we are now the kingdom of God on earth, though again, not in fullness. But we can see already you are bringing together people from every tribe and tongue and nation, and you are bringing together Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, to be one and to be united in this, that the eternal God took on our flesh and paid for our sins so that there is for us free salvation and everlasting life. And now we are called to bring glory to you with thankful hearts and to declare the excellencies of your grace and to see that your gospel be proclaimed, the pure word of the gospel be preached to all the world. And so we pray, though we are totally inadequate to this work, We ask that you will nonetheless use us because you chose us. And so we pray that this church will be the body of Christ and the sweet aroma of life to all who hear the gospel and you will call many to yourself. And we pray for the work you've given us as individuals in our own families and neighborhoods, schools and workplaces and among our friends, recognizing that it is we who will reach them, that sometimes they have access to no other believers. And Lord, we pray that we will speak the truth in love. As we know, there are many blasphemies. There are many denials of the truth. We know that there are those who speak of many gods and of no God, of those who speak of a Unitarian God. We know of those who speak of Jesus as a prophet, but not the eternal God. We know that they are blind and they are perishing. Help us not to ever be angry, but rather in love to preach the truth knowing that we were once blind, but now you've given us eyes to see, and we pray you will do the same wondrous work as the gospel is preached in all the world. 
So we pray for the work of our own congregation and our whole federation, and we are thankful for all confessional, reformed, and Presbyterian churches around the world preaching the pure word of the gospel. We pray for the work in Ventura, thankful for our privileged opportunity of participating in a church plant as well as the mission in Armenia. And we ask that you will bless that work and raise up shepherds to care for your people. Lord, we pray for the work that needs to take place by your churches in the United Kingdom and the United States. There are plenty of faithful confessional churches and believers. Lord, it is amazing to consider that we are granted the privilege of declaring the excellencies of your grace. So we pray that we will not be those who whine and complain about how things were better in the past, but rather we will consider our incredible opportunity of being a light in the darkness today, and yet of having so many others who pray with us and who evangelize with us and who bring the word of truth, the pure word of life, to many. And Lord, you have blessed the United Kingdom, the United States, and given many of their peoples the privilege of being your missionaries and ministers to the ends of the world and of supporting and building up the work of Christ. Now we pray as the sons and daughters of many faithful believers have left the church that you will be merciful and draw them back, even those among our own congregation who have professed faith and fallen away, that for your namesake, for the glory of your kingdom, you will restore them and strengthen their faith and cause them to fight the good fight of the faith and do good to one another. And as we saw, to be willing to die to self, take up our cross, love our neighbors, and build up the body. Lord, it is difficult to imagine that the work we have been given is a spiritual work. It must be done by the power of the Holy Spirit because of the Holy Spirit that builds up the mystical body of Christ on earth. Help us to take away our pride. Let us not rely on methodologies and programs, but on your power. And let us do so, so thankful for the awesome privilege of being partakers of the work of the kingdom of God, which will be forever and ever. And so we come to you now. We have been redeemed. We have been rescued. We have been made alive in Christ and adopted. And so we come before you as our God and Father, glorifying your name as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now please stand to hear the written word of the Lord. Hear then the written word from the Old Testament for selections taking from the uh, genealogies. These are the mothers of Jesus recorded in Matthew 1. Genesis 38, 13 through 16 and verse 24. Now when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance of Naim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she was not given him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let us come to, in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. Verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. Joshua 2.1. And Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. Ruth 3, 1 through 8. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz your relative, with whose young men, women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She replied, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. 
And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. When she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down, at midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived... And she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. From the New Testament, Matthew 1, and we'll read selected verses. The book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And all this seven or generations until the deportation to Babylon. So verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. From the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying in a dream, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. Then he called his name Jesus. Hebrews 2, 10 through 12. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. 11, 13 through 15, 16. All these, the faithful, died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So far, the written word. Our God, we come before you and we pray that we should understand who we are and that we should know better our Savior and his humiliation, his willingness to suffer every affront, every type of shame in order to purchase us. May we therefore glory in your grace and in your love and in all that is shown to us in your gospel. We ask this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this season year after year, and the whole world keeps talking about peace, the unfortunate thing is that they have no comprehension of what this peace means. They tend to mean it's a time to kind of set aside anger and kind of be nicer to people. Somebody signals, let them cut in front of you. Somebody cuts you off, don't chase them, don't curse. And that's kind of the idea of peace. But 
That's not the peace that's spoken of in the scriptures. Because when the angels announced there shall be peace, it was peace between a God who was angry with sinners, whom he had every right to destroy, and the men that he, in his justice, should have destroyed. It was a peace whereby the anger of God was turned away, and that anger, the just wrath of God, poured out on himself where Christ the Son, the eternal God, took on our flesh and stood in our place and died the sinner's death for us. And one of the things that we kind of marvel about is why? Why would he do such a thing? I mean, he's God. It doesn't make any sense. And that's part of it. The gospel really is nonsensical to our fleshly way of thinking because it is so gracious. It is a God who owes us nothing, who had everything, who was offended in every way by us over and over again, loving us and purchasing us. But when he does so, he does not do as you and I may do. I mean, when many of you here have either worked in a soup kitchen or given money to a beggar or something like that, when you did so, did you first go home and say, oh, I'm going to be serving the soup kitchen? I had better find my oldest clothes that are torn, that I've soiled myself in, that reek. I have to put those on so that I don't show myself to be superior to the beggars and to the hungry that I'm feeding. We never do that. We clean ourselves, we put on decent clothes, and we go there and we serve them as their betters. Not to be insulting, it's just that if they are in that condition, you're just physically in better shape than they are. But when God comes to rescue us, he doesn't come in his glory and majesty, but he lays it all aside and takes on our vileness. He took on the flesh that Adam had sinned in, the flesh that was condemned. But more than that, look at his lineage. He was not born from this godly line of demigods or the righteous ones of all the earth. He's born of one who worked as a prostitute, a woman who pretended to be a prostitute, and two others where there's some questions. And then, of course, a man who would go into a prostitute thinking she was one, and a king who would commit adultery with his friend's wife. Jesus is born from that line. He comes to us humiliated in that he could be mocked just simply for who he was. Just because he came from such a filthy line. But you see, he came for people like that. He came for sinners. And that's what we need to recognize. This time of peace on earth, peace between God and men, is not us deciding, I'm not going to get angry as quickly. It is God who is eternally holy and just, choosing to take our wrath, our punishment on himself, and instead announcing to us free and gracious forgiveness and his own power given to us in order that we would not only strive against sin, but that we would actually be able to show the light of God in the way we extend grace to others, how we come together as one body, the body of Christ, how we go out and proclaim the gospel to those who have actually murdered other Christians. In fact, if you look at the history of the church, and even today in some nations, the Christians who are evangelizing their neighbors are very often evangelizing the very people who murdered members of their own family. Parents, children, siblings, spouses. And yet, instead of desiring revenge, they are able to see this person already has the worst possible danger on his head. He is going to face the wrath of God for killing the apple of God's eye. And if I really have the spirit of Christ, I want there to be peace between God and this one also. And so I proclaim to them the gospel. And when we wonder, it's like, well, is the gospel for them? Yes, very much so, which is why when Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record for us, who is Jesus? 
he tells us several incredible things. Number one, this record, the Genesis, the genealogy of Jesus Christ is this, he is the son of David. He is the promised king who will rule. He will be the Solomon, the peace, the shalom, the, the king who will rule over a kingdom of peace and he will rule justly as we sang Psalm 98. And he will be the son of Abraham. The one that Abraham was told, the seed that would bring a blessing to all the nations. He would be the one who would turn this land of anger, hostility, war, and death into the kingdom of peace and light and life. And this Jesus would come at the right time. After the six days, if you will, after the labor and the death, he is our shalom, he is our Sabbath, he is our rest, he is our peace. But even with all that, it's recorded for us that he came from Tamar. Tamar who rightly felt wronged by Judah. Judah who was told, according to the laws of that time, that since Tamar has forsaken her family to marry yours, she is to be given descendants. And your first son died, your second son died, but when your third son is old enough, he has to go into her to give her a lineage, a line. Judah saw her as bad luck. Two of my sons have already died, I'm not going to give her my third son. So she was right in that she had been wronged by Judah. But the solution is not to take it upon herself and dress up as a prostitute and seduce Judah, but that's what she does. And what about Judah? He is the one to whom the promised scepter was given, from whom would come David and ultimately the Christ. He's the kind of man that goes to prostitutes. Hardly something we would be bragging about. And then when we get to the story of Joshua, you have Boaz is the son of Salmon and Rahab, whose profession was prostitute, and a Canaanite at that, after Israel has already been established as a people after being brought out of Egypt. And with the story of Ruth, Naomi, she is the Jewish woman who takes Ruth the Moabitess. Now remember, a Moabite are of the tribe of people that oppose the Israelites so much that God said to the 10th generation, no one from Moab is allowed to come into my temple. But here is Ruth now saying, I wish to be a Jew. And Naomi, who should be now helping nurture and guide her, turns out to be one of the most embittered, angry people in the world. Sees no good in anything, and yes, she's had a hard life, but she's embittered against God. And then the advice she gives to her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is do not go honestly to Boaz and speak to him and say, you know, I'd like to be your wife, but seduce him after he has had a night of celebration and drinking. Surprise him so that he can't say no. Hardly great virtue there. Boaz turns out to be very virtuous. And then, of course, when we get to the story of David the king, after his servants even tell him, that's your friend's wife. This is one of the 30 great men of Israel, a general who gave up being a Hittite in order to join the covenant community, has fought as a champion. That's his wife. And David says, yeah, go get her. We're not sure exactly what it means that she was bathing on the roof, but the point for us here is at least David now fathers the line of Jesus through adultery. This is the story we are given. So what kind of a savior do we have? On the one hand, great and glorious, the eternal God, holy and perfect, and yet of a human lineage, so vile. So is there something you've done that you think is too shameful for God to ever be willing to consider forgiving you? Well, Jesus was very willing to identify. In fact, the Spirit of God demanded of Matthew to record, remind people when they're reading the New Testament of all those ancient stories that were recorded in the Old Testament to know exactly from what kind of line the Messiah, the Chosen One, would come. Because I want people to know this one 
knows what it's like to be born into a family of shame. This one knows what it's like to be fleshly and weak, and he has come for me. And so it is recorded that even at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a question. Where, again, if somebody in our church said, I'm pregnant, but I am a virgin, it was the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. I don't think Mary was taken any more seriously. So he was born under a cloud. Though his mother was a virgin, he was born with the town obviously knowing. Either Mary and Joseph didn't wait, or Mary was a little too social. Either way, Jesus is not born honorably in the house of the king with everything showing itself to be good, but he is born the God-man into a family of shame because that is the only way he can come to save his people from their sins. And so the name Jesus is the Greek version of the name Joshua, and Joshua is Hebrew for God saves. And so here we are. He is born as the God with us, Emmanuel, and he is born as the Joshua, the God who saves. And he is not ashamed. He is not ashamed to be identified with you. He was not ashamed when he took your record of your sins on the cross. Remember, he's eternal God, omniscient, knowing all things at all times. On the cross, he wasn't just simply thinking that here I am, Pilate having condemned me, and there's these men crucifying me. He was able to think of you by name and every one of your sins. And as he died, he was thankful to the Father for the privilege of purchasing the elect, of ensuring that justice had been fulfilled. And therefore, there would be never again a call for you to have to account before God for that sin because it had been paid for. This Jesus was willing to be born in humble circumstances but better wording, shameful, degraded, horrible circumstances because that's the only way he could fully identify with you and me. And doing so, he went to the cross condemned, but now he is restored to all glory. And as he sits there in glory, seeing the holiness of his Father, and God the Father glorifying the Son who is holy and perfect and has fulfilled his will, what do they do? They speak of you and me as holy, perfect, just, and pure, united to Christ the head, and of destined to everlasting life, and a kingdom which gives life. We're born of prostitutes. We are shameful and degraded, and now here is the King of glory, not ashamed of calling us his brothers, of declaring the glory of God in our midst and giving his spirit to us so that our voice declares his glory. And God is not ashamed to be called our God or to call us his people, but instead he is declaring, I am making for you a yet more glorious city, what we saw through Zechariah and through all the imagery, through the temple, all the way to heavenly Jerusalem. Beloved, there was good reason to record the names of the mothers of Jesus because it takes away from us that mythology, takes away from us that foolish way of only looking at the holiness of God. That's also one of the reasons why The Reformed, rightly, have avoided all images, all pictures of Jesus, because what do you wind up with? Sentimental claptrap. You wind up with these puffy-cheeked babies with halos and all that. You don't see. No. What we are to know of is a shameful, degraded, humiliated Jesus, born in a stable among animal manure because his family was so disregarded and he was born under a cloud that his mother was a fornicator. No. We have to see how much shame he bore. And when we make it too glorious, we're failing to recognize the humiliation, the cloud under which he lived and died. No, the glory of God 
we can't even begin to imagine. We are going to see that in the age to come, but not yet. But right now, what you can know, that which is holy, glorious, eternal, and perfect, is not ashamed of you because you've been paid for, purchased. He is not ashamed for you to affirm before the world that he is your God and Father, and he declares to all creation, you are his precious child. And Jesus declares, by virtue of his work, he is, he is our brother. And so, beloved, we need to meditate upon these things rightly, be truly thankful for this redemption, a redemption given to the undeserving and yet given freely and abundantly such that Jesus tells us, be aware of who you were. Be conscious of what you've been redeemed and then never think about it again. Because to be godlike will also mean as far as the east is from the west, he's removed our sins from us. It means we will dwell in eternal glory, not thinking of our sins, and yet still knowing it was by grace we have been saved. What an amazing thing. He doesn't want us constantly ashamed, but he wants us rejoicing in his glory in which we live, which is why he can call us his people. So let's never forget of what stock we are where we've come from, what we are capable of still doing until we're glorified. And let us recognize it is from this very sort of people that Jesus was descended. And for this very sort of people, he came to die. This very sort of people he has redeemed. And so, is there any sin you have that will not be forgiven? Of course not. If you bring it to Christ, he is gracious willing to forgive because he came for people just like you and me. Let's pray. We come before you, our God, thankful that we are not being deceived by the lies of the wicked one because you graciously have made us alive. We are no better than anyone else. In fact, we can see the type of lines from which we have been descended. And yet it is to such people you have come and you've delivered us from death to life. And now we pray we will see Jesus Christ humiliated yet as the God-man, his humiliation necessary to also be the God who saves sinners by the flesh of the sinner who sinned. We ask, O oh Lord, that we should therefore bring all glory and praise to you, be thankful for the gift that we have received, and be witnesses of your grace to all the world. And Lord, we thank you for the wondrous news of even these women and men so naturally unworthy and yet given by you to the mothers and fathers of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we hope to see an eternal glory forevermore. Amen. And so, beloved, let us then stand and sing that Christmas song, O come, O come, Emmanuel, awaiting a call for the final deliverance promised, all resting on the promise of the Lord God. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the sun of God appear. Rejoice! Thine own from 
say John's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to fly. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Oh, Please be seated. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus, when he had finished his work and ascended to heaven, did not intend for us to have no testimony of his ministry, but he gave to us the word. He sent his spirit to his disciples to remind them of all he did and all he taught. But in addition to that, he also commanded that in his church, there would be a sealing sign that would testify to his presence. And this was not pictures, but it was the bread and the wine, because he wanted us to focus on him as the Savior, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he said, you want to see me? You want to remember me? This is the way, in the bread and the wine, with the formulary, because it explains what we are doing and participating. And so the Lord's Supper is given to you and me as a sure testimony of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ of the effectiveness, the usefulness of his work and of his spirit continuing that work, not just purchasing you, but sanctifying you and strengthening you to be a loving and forgiving person and a courageous and knowledgeable evangelist. And when you say, but I'm not adequate to the task, he says, yeah, that's why I'm with you. So we come to receive the Lord's Supper as a sealing sign and as an aid to our Christian life. And it is a blessing given from God because he testifies as a king would call you to a banquet and feed you, so now be assured you've been brought in. You are safe in the palace and you are my children, I am feeding you. And so we receive these things with thankful hearts, affirming that indeed we belong to Jesus Christ. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Because as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So therefore anybody who would eat or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, hypocritically, without faith, unrepentant, would be guilty of degrading and profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Now for all who still live in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to live under his gracious reign, we ask you to abstain. Nevertheless, for those of you who've confessed your sins and affirmed your faith in Christ, the promise is sure. 
Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. You're invited to this sacred meal, not because you're worthy in yourself, but because you're clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. So do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from coming to the table because it is given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And as the word has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and a living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through these holy mysteries, may enjoy with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven where he continues to intercede on our behalf. And through this mystery, by your own word and spirit, these common elements are now set apart from their ordinary use. And while they remain bread and wine, the sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify. We do not doubt, but we joyfully believe. We will receive in this meal nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now, we go to our heavenly table to receive the gift of God for our souls. Amen. Beloved, that we may be nourished with Christ the true bread from heaven, let us lift up our hearts to Christ our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us firmly believe all his promises, not doubting that we shall really be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood, this through the work of the Holy Spirit, as surely as you are now going to receive bread and wine from the hand of the minister in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Our great God, we are thankful that you came to rescue, to redeem the kind of people you actually knew us to be. Lord, we pray that we will no longer be deceived, that we are going to be great law keepers who will earn your love and we will be rewarded when we have done good. As we come to this table, let us see it is your crucifixion, your bloody death for us that is our only hope. And let us receive then this testimony. It is only Jesus who is able to save and make us a life and deliver us to everlasting glory. So we come to you to receive from you this visible gospel testimony this day. Amen. And so, beloved, understand in the Lord's Supper, it is not you telling the world what you think, but it is you being lifted up by God to, to actually be with Christ. And so the sursum quota, uh, corda, as it's called, the call to lift up your hearts. Beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. Come forward now to receive the elements and return to your seats and we will partake together. I can't give you up. I can't surrender you. I can't make you like the cities of judgment or treat you like the places I have destroyed. My heart is turned over within me. My compassions are kindled. I'm not going to execute my fierce anger against you. I will never destroy you again because I am God and not a man. I am the Holy One in your midst. I will come in mercy. I will not come to you in wrath. And you, my people, seeing the work that I have done, will sing my praises as you are gathered together again. When the Lord brought us back, when he brought the captives back, it was like a dream. Our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongues with joyful shouting, saying to all the nations, the Lord has done great things for his people. The Lord has done great things for us, and so we are glad. 
We have been restored, O Lord, as streams go forth and turn the desert into a generous, bountiful land, O God. We thank you for pouring out your spirit and bringing us home. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into judgment, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. I came so that you may have life and have it to overflowing. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. I know you, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And so I lay down my life for you, the sheep. And you will hear my voice, and you will come and be one flock with me as your one shepherd. And I will lay down my life for you. No one will take my life from me, but I will lay it down of my own initiative because I have the authority and the power, and I choose to do it for you. We know the kind of men who were the disciples of Jesus, but in that night he was betrayed, in the night that he was going to go to be tried, he loved them to the end. And he wanted them to know that though they would be seeing him taken away by the Roman guard, that he was actually going to be with them always by the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, more gloriously, they would be united to him. And so he gave the Lord's Supper as a physical sign and testimony. That night he took the bread, broke it, and told his disciples, this is my body broken for you to take the wrath of God upon myself so that you will be delivered from your sins. So, beloved, take, eat, remember, and believe the body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for you. Jesus also took the cup and he told his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You don't have to look back any longer to the Passover lamb because now what that typified has come, which is why John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Beloved, take, drink, remember, believe Christ's blood given to you for the forgiveness of your sins and to strengthen your life for the age to come. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the great mystery of this holy feast. And although we are unworthy, naturally, to share this meal with you, we know that it is by your invitation, dressed by you in Christ's robes of righteousness, that we have come boldly into the Holy of Holies. Instead of encountering the wrath we deserved, we received your pardon. In the place of the fear that would fill our hearts in the sight of your holiness, by the gospel of grace we've been given hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you and even now is interceding for us at your right hand. So God, please strengthen us by these gifts so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on your name, we may by your spirit honor you with our souls and bodies to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. Ordinarily now we would have the offerings collected, but you may give your offerings as you exit. This allows you to tangibly aid in the evangelization of the whole world, the missions to the nations, church planting. We want a people to know of the sacrifice of Christ and to benefit from it. And so it is your prayers, your being here and encouraging one another with words and just sometimes with being able to be alongside and cry with those who need and also in now training up the next generation of ministers and church planters. So beloved, it is an incredible privilege we have to be part of the body of Christ in this work. So let us conclude by singing a doxology to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Stand and let us sing the doxology on page seven.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And beloved, be assured, the Lord is with you continuing to uphold you, preserving you for everlasting glory. Yahweh the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace that you may be assured through all the trials and tribulations ordained for your growth and holiness. You are already more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves you. Be assured that nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God because God's love for you is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.